The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the hosts and creators of this program. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. You're tuned to the ultimate in pet talk radio, The Pet Buzz, on Cortell U Road Radio. In this episode of The Pet Buzz, Valerie Nunez Atkinson talks about winning the 140th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. The Humane Society of the United States is with us discussing how chaining dogs is a form of animal cruelty. Our panel of expert guests weighing about human health benefits of pet ownership. And the American Kennel Club's Brandy Hunter is with us talking about the most popular dog breeds in America. We welcome our listeners who tune in each week from around the globe. But you know, before we begin our global news block, I want to remind pet lovers to use our social media channels on Twitter or Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. You can also write us on team at thepetbuzz.com. We encourage you to share your opinions, suggest show topics or guests, or send a picture of your dog, cat, or any other pet. Tell us about his or her unique personality. We will address your tweets, posts, and emails on next week's show. And now, Pet Buzz News from around the globe. What's the big news? Well, the Westminster Kennel Club recently crowned a new champion as America's dog. California Journey, CJ for short, was named Best in Show at Madison Square Garden on Tuesday evening, February 16th. His breeder, owner, handler, as well as being a professional handler herself, Valerie Nunez Atkinson is here to talk about her German short-haired pointer and her Best in Show win at the second oldest continuously held sporting event in the United States. Wow, that's so great. Good morning, Valerie. Welcome to the Pet Buzz. Good morning. How are both of you? Oh, we are so delighted that you're here to join us today. So let me get started right away here. Um, First of all, let me congratulate you again for winning the most exciting and iconic dog show in the world. Uh, Can you tell us how you got started showing dogs? Um, well, I actually started when I was about seven years old through my father. He bought a German short hair pointer just as a personal gun dog and um, somehow found out about field trials and got involved in that and then eventually breeding them. And um, one of the people we sold a puppy to from our very first litter took me to a handling class, and that's how it all started. That's when the love affair began. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, moving forward to today, and it was very exciting to see your big win. Um, What was it like? I mean, I'm sure everyone asks you the same question, but what was it like when Dr. Richard Mean announced that you were the 140th winner of the Westminster Kennel Club annual dog show? Was it like a dream? I mean, did you ever think you would win? um, Well, I, I don't know that I ever thought I would win. I always had hoped and dreamt I would win. Um, it has probably been my one singular, uh, you know, goal in life, as in anybody that's involved in showing purebred dogs. Um, so, yes, when I was 10 years old and I started showing in junior showmanship um, at AKC shows, uh, it became a, a goal then and a dream then. And I have to tell you, when Dr. Mean pointed to me, I certainly thought he was going towards the German Shepherd rumor. Um <laughs> So I fell to my knees and and just disbelief, pure disbelief. Well, well, tell us about CJ and and his breed. CJ is a German short hair pointer. He's three years old. Um, he comes from a long line. We, we've been breeding short hairs for about forty five years now. Um, like I said, we started out with hunting dogs. Um, we went into field trial dogs, and then my dad got out of short hairs. And I kind of took it over with a mentor um, in German short hair pointers, Marilyn Stockland, when I was about 15. And we started breeding more for show dogs that were beautiful but could still go out and do what they are originally bred. So although we don't compete in field trials anymore, we do um, take advantage of the hunt test that AKC offer to still show that our dogs can do what they are originally bred for. Well, you know, it's interesting because CJ is related to another Westminster winner, correct? He is, his grandmother. And that was Carly, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, you know, it's interesting because the AKC list just came out of popular breeds. And I noticed that the German short hair was number 11 on the list. So if someone was interested in getting a German short haired pointer, you know, what kind of owner 
or what type of owner would, what kind of type of owner would a German short hair do best with? Well, I think a young, active family is probably the best type of um, owners for a German Shorthair Pointer. They are high energy. They're a very active dog. Um, they require um, some, anytime we sell puppies, we recommend that they do at least one or two puppy classes with their, with their babies. Um, just basic obedience. Um, they are not a great kennel dog. They are not a good dog that can be left in the backyard and think that they're not going to be destructive, whether they're digging or chewing something. Um, so the more you put into your dog, as in any purebred dog, um, the more time you, and effort you put into training them and spending time with them, the better dog they're going to be. And um, for short hairs, you know, a young family that has kids, they're great with children. Um, they're great going out on a trail hiking and being involved with their family. That's what they want most. Well, just to remind all of our listeners, we are talking with the winner of the 140th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, and that's Valerie with CJ. So, Valerie, when CJ is not showing, is he like all other dogs? What does he like to do at home? <laughs> Actually, he very much is like every other dog. Um, I just got back from, I took him down and had his health clearance done today for his heart. That was the last thing um, he needed to have done, and he got a perfect score from the cardiologist. His heart is absolutely perfect. It's Yay. an athletic heart is what he said. But we were laughing because he had a great big grass stain on his back end. Huh. And um, so I think his housemate, which is a whippet named Ramona, um, she rules him. And I think she doesn't think he's so special because <laughs> I think she tumbled him this morning on the grass and he has a great big grass stain. So now that you've won, what's next for both of you? Well, um, you know, it's kind of an unusual situation. Most dogs that win at Westminster um, are usually coming to the end of their career. In this instance, CJ just turned three years old a month ago. So he is beginning his career. Um, so we will continue to show. Um, we have a show this weekend down here in San Diego, California, and um, we will be there with bells and whistles on. You know, one of the things that I found most touching, and, I, and I've told you this before, is that when you won, you know, you were, you talked about showing dogs from a young girl and how important that was. And I was so touched by that because as I go to Westminster year after year after year, I sit and I look in the stands and what's most disappointing is there are no more young people. Correct. There are no mm -hmm. more people who dream of owning one of those great dogs or showing one of those great dogs. So my last question for you is what advice do you have for young people who are interested in showing dogs or committed to any sport? Um, just get involved. I was, um, we're going to be going and doing a um, little program for my children's um, school with CJ. And I was thinking about that very question. And I'm an advocate of purebred dogs and purebred sports with dogs. Um, we have so many wonderful things that children and families can get involved in. Showing confirmation was a wonderful thing for our family. Our whole family was involved, and it, it's a great family sport. They have agility. They have dock diving. They have relay. They have all different kinds of sports. And, and I think having that made available to young children and having parents get involved, it's, it's a wonderful way to enjoy time with your family and with your pets. Um, so I, I do my best to encourage them. I hold various classes and, and really try to bring along some youngsters. And I have some assistants that come and work for me. And, um, you know, I hope eventually they'll be giving back to the sport themselves. Wow, what, what wonderful advice, Valerie. Do you have a website where our guests can learn more? Um, we do. Um, our, our German Shore Her Pointer website is called Mist, Mist Kennels. It's M-Y-S-T kennels.com. And um, that's all about our, our GSPs um, that we've been breeding for about 45 years. Gee, thank you for being with us today. 
Yeah, You're very th- welcome. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was Valerie Nunez Atkinson, winner of the 140th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. We want to remind you that if you want to learn more about that iconic dog show, you can listen to our February 14th podcast at WSRQRadio.com. And after our commercial break, Doc and I are talking with Lee Ann Lassiter from the Humane Society of the United States. She's going to be talking about chain dogs as a form of animal cruelty. So stay tuned. On Court Tell You Road Radio. Does your pet have dry, flaky, and itchy skin? Do you find yourself visiting the veterinarian repeatedly because Fido or Fluffy has skin allergies or ear infections? EpiPet to the rescue. Developed by a veterinarian, EpiPet is a revolutionary, high-performance skin and ear care product line made with the finest natural ingredients. EpiPet, for you and your pet, means better pet health. For more information, visit epi-pet.com. Welcome back to the Ultimate in Pet Talk Radio. I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. And I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. You are tuned into the Pet Buzz on Cortell U Road Radio. You know, of the 70 plus million dogs in American households, the vast majority are living happy, healthy lives. But some dogs are still chained or tethered in one place as a mean of restraint. Yeah, it's horrible. In some cases, tethers are used for short stretches of time, but a small number of dog owners tether their dogs constantly or for many, many hours at a time. And today we're speaking with Leanne Lassiter, Animal Cruelty Policy Director for the Humane Society of the United States about chaining or tethering dogs as a form of animal cruelty. Welcome to the Pet Buzz, Leanne. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, it's so great to have you here because you're the first representative we've had from the Humane Society of the United States. But I'm going to go and start out with the first question. Tell us a little bit about the Humane Society, you know, and and as well as your duties with them. Sure. Well, the Humane Society of the United States is one of the nation's leading animal protection organizations. Uh, We were formed in 1954 to be the national voice of animal protection. Um, And, you know, there are so many wonderful people who are are in the trenches and working in local shelters and humane organizations every day. And they just don't have the time to really um, work on these national issues like this and, and put the muscle of the nation and all the animal lovers out there behind it. So that's what HSUS does. Well, Leanne, let's move on to one of these important issues then. Can you describe uh, to our listening audience, what is this chaining or tethering of dogs? Sure. Well, chaining is typically the practice of fastening a dog to a stationary object and leaving them unattended. Um, Chaining tends to refer to situations where there are thick, heavy chains that are used and a dog is attached to a stationary object. Um, tethering is typically referred to as sort of a partial restraint, maybe a pulley system. Um, and they're, they're obviously not meant to refer to a dog that's just being walked on a leash or, or tem- temporarily tied out while an owner's present. But typically these are animals who live outside unattended, somehow fastened to an object or a pulley. Oh, that's just so horrible. So like, for me, there's a problem with continuous chaining or tethering. Um, is, is that, is that seems like that's becoming the case now, right? Absolutely. Um, the dogs are very social beings. They, they need to be with people or they need to be with other animals. You know, we, we bring them into our lives because of the companionship that they, they offer, you know, and, and we've taught them that to be part of our family and to be domesticated animals, um, and dogs who live outside, continuously chained are at risk of death, organ damage, frostbite, heat stroke, just because they're subjected to extreme and constant exposure to extreme weather conditions. Um, and a lot of chained dogs are sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, you know, and that's not to say that everybody who has a, a chained or tethered dog mistreats them, but in our experience, a lot of dogs who are constantly chained at the back of a property somewhere where nobody's paying attention can lack a lot of food and water and just basic care. Well, Leanne, I've got a two-part question, if you can help me with this. Um, are chained dogs dangerous to people and other pets? And 
her chain dogs in danger themselves? Right. Well, they they absolutely can be. Uh, to to answer the first question about being dangerous to people and pets, you know, you can take an otherwise very friendly docile dog and keep them continuously chained or or intensively confined in any way, and they become neurotic, uh, anxious. They become aggressive. Um, they chain dogs because they have such a small space to live in, they become extremely territorial over that very small space. It leads them to be increasingly reactive where they may try to chase or bite or just defend their territory from a perceived threat. And, of course, that becomes even more dangerous when they perceive the threat as a small child who wanders into their territory. Um, the, The Center for Disease Control Research found that dogs are 2.8 times more likely to bite than a non-chained dog. And, of course, that's, that's not due just to the chaining, but a lot of times it's due to the lack of socialization and, and behavior training that chained dogs get from their caretakers. And I'm also so, assuming that if they're chained up, then they're stuck and they could be, you know, prey for other wild animals or people. Or or people, you're exactly right. I mean, they there are so many um, medical issues that happen with chained dogs, where we often see the the collars growing into their neck because oh. they're not getting the daily attention from their owners. Um, we've seen dogs that are chained without proper collars or proper harnesses, where people are actually tying cables around their neck, where they're chained with, like, pinch or choke-type collars, or where where they just have the chain wrapped around their neck, and then they're tied to a stationary object, like a tree or a pole. Um, So, in addition to to that, they're also vulnerable to entanglement, strangulation, um, and then, of course, like you said, the harassment and attacks by dogs, wildlife, and and even malicious people. Well, Well, if you've just joined us, if you've just joined us, we're talking with the Humane Society of the United States, is Lee Ann Lassiter. And you had a question, Dr. Flack? Yeah, I have a, for in the contemporary society, is there a grouping of, of people that you identify that are doing the tethering of dogs, or is it across the board, all socioeconomic groups, et cetera? Um, definitely. I mean, we. I think we tend to, to find it... We find it all over the place. You'd be, be surprised at, at some of the, the communities where you'll find chain dogs. Um, but it, it tends to be people who maybe haven't really had access to the chain dogs, or they're just following the path of their parents, what their parents taught them to do. Um, so there are so many organizations out there. Um, you know, I can name one, Census for Fido in Oregon, and, and there are groups like this all over the country who are actually going out and building fences for people and teaching people how to get their dogs off the chaining and the dangers of chaining. Um, and, you know, they're raising raising money and through donations from the public and people who care, they're building fences and providing proper shelters to help better the quality of life for dogs who live outdoors. Well, it's great that you mentioned, um, I guess, what was the organization in Oregon? Fences Fences for for Fido. Fido. Yeah, what else can communities do about chain dogs? I mean, can you suggest some ways that our listeners can help as well? Sure, absolutely. So uh, two things. One is that it is, you know, working with owners, just as in these groups, the way these groups do, working with owners to improve the situation for their dogs is always the best option. I know, you know, a lot of people, we have such soft hearts for dogs and we want to rescue them from that situation immediately. Um, and, and sometimes just taking them out of that situation and taking them to a shelter or a rescue is going to overwhelm you know, an already overwhelmed organization who's dealing with straying homeless pets. Um, so we've we found that most people are very open to some sort of support and they're open to change. They just need to be taught a better way to do it. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of a mistake to to just assume that because people chain their dogs, they don't care about their dogs. Um, we actually find they care about their dogs very much. They just may not have kind of the personal experience or, or the guidance in their life growing up as a child to, to understand that society is kind of changing and we don't, you know, chaining dogs is, is not the way to do it anymore. 
I also think um, it's a good idea, probably, if you look and see what the legislation is in your community. Is that correct? That's right. That was um, actually our campaign, the, the Animal Cruelty and Fighting Campaign of the Humane Society of the United States, has literally just finished yesterday a toolkit on um, outdoor dogs and specifically how to work with your local community, with your county commissioners and city council to pass local ordinances that restrict tethering and it basically in a way to improve the quality of life for the dogs who are living on chain. Um, it's a very, very comprehensive toolkit. Um, it includes things like a step-by-step guide on how to pass a tethering ordinance in your community, um, how to become familiar with the issue, how to create a coalition of people who think like you to help pass those ordinances, um, and everything from drafting and compromising with with opposition groups and using social media to your advantage to get these ordinances passed. Great. That's wonderful information. We're going to have to get one of those kits from you, put it up on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. And it's, it should be up on our website by Monday. Um, like I said, it was literally just finished yesterday. So, um, it, But in the meantime, you can go to uh, humanesociety.org and just type chaining in the search box, and it'll lead you right to a lot of information about chaining and tethering, and that's where that toolkit will be posted on Monday. I was just going to ask you to give us your website, so you've already done <laughs> that. Thank you so much. Perfect. Well, let me uh, tell our listeners, and thank you again, Leanne Lassiter, American Cruelty Policy Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Thank you so much for being here with thank us. You we for appreciate being with us. it. Great, well, I really great appreciate discussion. you addressing this issue. Thank you. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with our roundtable discussion with experts discussing human health benefits of owning a dog. Or a cat. Or a cat on Cortell You Road Radio. Warmer temperatures mean more time outside. You have sunscreen for yourself, but what about Fido? According to the American Animal Hospital Association and the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, pets need sunscreen too. Use EpiPet Sun Protector, the only FDA-approved pet sunscreen on short-haired, light-colored, hairless, golden retrievers, and other dogs susceptible to skin cancer. Contained in a sports bottle, EpiPet allows you to turn the bottle upside down, making it easier to spray your dog all over to protect your dog from the sun all day and every day. Visit Epi pet.com Why should humans be the only ones eating healthy? Your pets deserve the finest in organic and natural food and treats too. Natural Frontier Market is all natural for all animals, with or without fur. Stop by and check out our pet department at 1102 Cortelyu Road, Brooklyn. Natural Frontier Market. At Natural Frontier Market, we know humans aren't the only ones who deserve to eat healthy. Your pets deserve the finest in organic and natural food and treats too. Natural Frontier Market is all natural for all animals. Stop by and check out our pet department at 1102 Cortelyu Road, Brooklyn. Natural Frontier Market. You are listening to the Dynamic Pet Duo on the Pet Buzz. In this segment of the show, Doc Fleck and I are hosting our roundtable discussion. You bet. Where our expert guests weigh in about topics you want to hear about. Joining us today is author Sandy Robbins and dog trainer and author, my dear friend, Brian Kilcummins. Welcome to the Pet Buzz, Sandy. Hello, Charlotte. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the chat. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. I love that. (laughs) Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here with us. Charlotte, my pleasure, as always. It's always nice interacting with you. Well, before we get started... Oh, good. Hey, thank you. I was recognized. You were recognized. I know. (laughs) I know. But it used to always be the other way around. You know, it was like Dr. Fleck and whatever. Okay. So, (laughs) before we get started... You know, tell us what you guys have been up to. Sandy, why don't you start? I think you have a new book coming out you mentioned. I do have a new book coming out. It's called Making the Most of All Nine Lives. It's about an amazing orange tabby who is the ultimate copycat. And we're launching the book uh, in New York in April. And uh, with it comes the launch of the first National Tabby Day, which I hope we're going to be able to grow to be as big as Take Your Dog to Work Day. Send us an invite. Send us an invite. We'll try to be there. Of course. You, you will be on the guest list, I promise you. And I love, by the way, it's a great, great organization. And they also offer medical care. So, and Brian, what are you up to? 
Well, uh, a little while ago, I just finished uh, uh, a DVD video. It's uh, in fact, it's online. Uh, it's police encounters with dogs. Okay, which was done by the Department of Justice. Awesome, which, Brian. Uh, shows, awesome. Which shows non-lethal means of police officers uh, interacting with dogs. They're shooting way too many dogs for dumb reasons. So this really starts teaching them how to go about preventing that. Really? Well, I can tell you right now, we are going to have you back in the next month because that is a topic near and dear to both of our Absolutely. hearts. Absolutely. So that's something that we want to talk about. But let's get started with our roundtable discussion. Doc, why don't you introduce our topic for well, the good. day? Well, good. The topic for this week is, is really an area of great interest to me, and that is how pet ownership benefits humans and their human health. And um, so I've been reviewing some of the studies out that discuss the importance of pet ownership on human health. And one of the first studies was done in 2001. The study looked at 48 people with high blood pressure and high stress jobs who agreed to ad adopt a, a dog or cat. Doc, I have to ask you one quick question. Who doesn't have a high stress job these days? Um, I, yeah, it's a really good question. <laughs> so I guess everybody should be concerned about this. But uh, half, half of the people uh, adopted either a dog or cat. And uh, after six months, they reevaluated the people again to see if there had been any significant changes in the blood pressure of, of the individuals. Um, so fast forward today, we have so many studies. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of discover from you guys, too, as experts, what you think are some of the other human health benefits of pet ownership. We know that it reduces stress and reduces high blood pressure. So, Sandy, let's go to you first. What what other human health benefits have you experienced for people? Well, you know, pets, both cats and dogs, can be so funny and so amusing that um, no matter how stressed you are, you will stop and you will laugh um, when they do something really ridiculous in front of you. And I don't have to tell you, laughter is the best medicine. And you can never have too much laughter. I think it's a wonderful way to inject um, time out, so to speak, in a hectic schedule, is to spend time with your pets. Great suggestion. I think that's a great suggestion. And, you know, it's funny because we had Jessica Myrick on, who's a professor at Indiana University. Remember, yeah, Jessica? I do. Dr. Jessica. And actually, she was the one who did the study about watching cat videos. And they determined that watching cat videos was, was good for your health. Gave you a chuckle yeah. during the day. Hey, Brian, what, what you, got, you got some experiences for us? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things, especially with our society and, and communication today, is dogs are a social icebreaker. I mean, Charlie, oh, like you lived in the city for a long time. I love I that mean, social icebreaker. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. Um, you know, you, you go to talk to somebody, they're usually defensive. If you have a dog, they're like, yeah, well, isn't that cute? So it brings about a social interaction that normally wouldn't happen, and it's probably one of the few things that will get people off their iPhones or iPads as they're walking. Was that a chick getter? A chick getter. Yeah. <laughs> only no, I, I, Sandy, Sandy. I, I only guys. I only guys. No, I, I, I met my husband walking a dog. The dog <laughs> and holding the sheepdog stood on his foot, and I stopped to apologize. <laughs> Listen to you. <laughs> You know, now I, I dogs, now I know dogs. how the conversation is that, getting real. That's really interesting. <laughs> I think pets, pets on the whole make us better people <laughs> because we're caring for something outside of ourselves. And again, it's a way of garnering social interaction or common ground. Even if if I go to a cocktail party, if people find out I'm a dog trainer, I'm like, save me, because they just line up. You right, know, as and, far as wanting to talk about one of their family members. Right, and they whip out, I mean, whip out their, their iPhones or whatever, Androids, and of course, I'm sure you see all the million pictures that everyone has to show That's you. why when I go to a meeting, I say I'm a garbage collector. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, I've known Sandy and Brian long enough, they know I'm not with a garbage collector. Okay. <laughs> well, that must be a stopper in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, a garbage collector with a trust fund. Okay, but you know, I, I got to tell you, and it's interesting for with both of you what you, both of you said because one of the things that I always find the most interesting is the difference between elderly people with a pet and who don't have a pet. And you know, we know those studies have shown that elderly people have a lot more mobility. They can climb up on stools, they can bend over, but 
especially for older individuals, and I live in a town with a lot of seniors, the ones who have pets are more active, they're more emotionally healthy, and they get out and they walk with their dog. I mean, you know, and they actually buy the appropriate size pet for their uh, their health. But I, I mean, I think that's that's great. I mean, I think and- it's more it's more than that, Charlotte, because you know we don't address our need for touch, the human need for touch. And when, you know, especially in today's society, touch is pretty, you know, dangerous sometimes. You know, dogs and cats are still two things that we can touch readily. And that interaction, you know, reduces your heart rate, reduces your blood pressure. But I also think there's a uh, more deep, a deeper feeling of being connected to someone or something that keeps us healthier and happier. Well, you know, that really blends right in to my next question really for both of you or our discussion i know you're doing good you know i like the chick finder that was good um but anyway you know let's talk a little bit more about those emotional benefits etc and let me start out with you first sandy wait on brian uh what do you think uh, what about cats ownership does that provide the emotional health benefits Oh, absolutely. I think both cats and dogs are very empathetic creatures. I think they understand us better than we realize. And they know how to tap into our emotions. And, uh, you know, it's a great way to reciprocate love uh, to a little being that is so connected with you. I think it's a, it's very healthy. And I think it, it gets us out of ourselves too. When you have to have, you know, you take responsibility for a little creature like that. Sometimes you stop worrying about yourself and your own issues and you focus on them, which I think is a definitely a health benefit. You know, it's funny because over the years I've, I've known Brian and Brian's worked with a lot of famous people. Um, some I say are famous. Yeah, he's working with us. Some, well, some are notorious. Some are celebrities, right, Brian? Some are just plain famous. But one of the things that we talked about the other day was the fact that, and this is my conversation with Brian, seeing people from week to week as they get a dog and they work with Brian. And Brian, do you see a change in them? I mean, do you see, are they more relaxed from week to week as you go to their house once they get used to having that dog? Do you see those benefits start kicking well, in right away? Well, Charlotte, you know as well as, you know, I I do that the dog can't change unless the owner does. So as far as getting them, and I think one of the biggest things is dogs live in the moment. And people are always projecting stuff. And you have to reel them back going, no, we're going to stay in the moment now. You know, the dog is not going to think about, oh, am I going to bark at another dog? Where the owner may be concerned about that, which is often to the future. So I think it does have a, it changes people's personalities because they have to master certain things within themselves. Anger is not appropriate in, in training or relating to your dog, right? Frustration, all the stuff that comes up on the human level has to be handled in order for the dog to understand what the owner wants in a very clear, humane way. That's a very good point. Boy, you know, we're running up against it right now, but... I'd like to get one more tip from Sandy and Brian, if we could. Sandy, first. February is National Cat Health Month. Give us one tip for feline health. The, 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 the. This is the best thing you can ever do with your cat is to play with them. Cats are not supposed to be couch potatoes snoozing on the couch. They really appreciate mental and physical uh, interaction with you. So play with them, even in short spurts of 10 minutes a day. Um, You know, that's the best thing you can do for your pet. They really appreciate that. Great tip. Now, Brian, it's Responsible Pet Ownership Awareness Month. Can you give us one great dog tip? Yeah, dogs, you give commands, cats, you make suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> well, before letting you go, you, if, you go ahead. If, if people want more information, they can go to my website, breakpets.com. I'd be happy to Well, help. that was my next question. That was absolutely my next question. That would be your next comment. So, <laughs> Sandy, since Brian already yes. gave us his website, why don't you give us your website? Thank you. I am sandyrobbinsonline.com, and that's Sandy with a Y and Robbins with one B. Special thanks to Sandy Robbins and Brian Kilcommons for joining us today. That was a great discussion about Fun. how, yeah, absolutely, how 
pet ownership benefits human health. So why don't you tell us how your pet helps your health? Tweet us, post a comment on our social media channels at The Pet Buzz. You can even write us at team at thepetbuzz.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with one of our favorite guests talking the most popular about the most popular dog breeds in America. On Cortell You Road Radio. Welcome back to The Cat Show. Up next, we have Nico. Nico is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right. A group known especially for their sunspot sleeping, ball chasing, leg rubbing, and of course, companionship. Just look how she struts. It's like she owns the place. And see how she curls up and cuddles her person. The pitch on her purring is simply perfect. Nice one. Fantastic cat. But really the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Nico is to meet one. Visit theshelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. You're listening to the dynamic pet duo on the Pet Buzz. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. You know, the American Kennel Club has just released its list of most popular dog breeds in America. So I'm just curious, what are the most popular dog breeds? Well... We're going to find out from the Director of Public Relations of the American Kennel Club, Brandy Hunter, is back to give us the canine scoop on who's a hot dog. The hot dogs. I love that. Yeah. Good morning, Brandy. Good morning. How are you? Good. Well, how are you this morning? I'm wonderful. Cannot complain at all. All right. We're going to have you get right into this thing now. So please tell us, why does the American Kennel Club compile a list of the most popular dog breeds each year. Well, it's a really, really popular announcement with people. And what we're hoping for is those people that are loyal to their breeds get really excited, which they do, and get really competitive. And we're hoping that new people who would like to own a specific breed of dog or are unsure about what kind of dog they might want get some new information, kind of perk their ears up about the new breeds or the breeds that are rising faster than others and do their research to find a dog that works for them. Okay, here's the million-dollar question. Uh-huh. What are the nation's favorite breed of dog? <laughs> well, you want the top five, or would you like the top ten? Top ten, baby, top ten. You want a ten on down? We ten can do on down. Way. Okay, number ten is the Boxer. Boxer, Good. okay. Number nine is the Rottweiler. Good. Number eight is the Poodle. Good. Standard number or just, just in general? The three Poodles? Just in general. Okay, just in general. Mm, based on the way that we recognize the breed, yes. Okay. Number seven is the Yorkshire Terrier. Okay, big barks for those Yorkies. Big barks for the Yorkies. Number six is the French Bulldog. Sounds like LA to me. Go (laughs) Frenchies. Go Frenchies, go. Number five is the Beagle. Bay, I don't know how to bay. How do you bay, how do you bay, Brandy? I have no idea how to bay. They're better at it than I am. Okay. (laughs) Number four is the Bulldog. Ugh. We love that, and we love seeing that that bulldog in the ring. In the ring during absolutely. Westminster, winning that, the group. That was great. Mm-hmm. Are they not the cutest? They are slobbery. So cute. I just, you know, it's funny. I just did an event last weekend for Bounty Paper Towels, mm-hmm. and that we had some of the slobberest, the slobberest. I don't know what the word is. They were more slobbery. More slobbery than other. They were slobbering all over the place. They slobbered all over my clothes. But it was you know great. What? It's great love to have. It Absolutely. Really is. It's great love to have. It's some of the best love we get at dog shows. Love it. Love it. Okay. Next. Keep going. Next. <laughs> Number three is the Golden Retriever. Love that. Mm-hmm. We have a Golden Retriever named mm-hmm. Tana Banana Saigon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nice. And number two is the German Shepherd Dog. Ooh. We love German Shepherds. Another group winner at Westminster. Exactly. And, yes, and, and, another and, group and, winner. And, and your show, right? Didn't the German yes, Shepherd win your work. show? Yes. Rumor won the group at Westminster, but she did win Best in Show in December at our show in Orlando at the AENC National Championship. Sorry. Wow. It's hard to abbreviate those sometimes. Yeah. Um, We'll be there next year, this year. You should. You should. It's a great show. We'd love to have you. Come on down. Number one. Number one. Hold it steady. Hold and steady is a Labrador Retriever. <laughs> Labrador Retriever. God, Twenty-five I love those years. Labradors. Love those Labradors. That's 25 amazing. Twenty-five years. So why do you think it's been ranked number one for 25 years? Well, Labs are a really popular breed because they tend to fit in with almost every type of family. They're just the right amount of lap dog. They're just the right amount of active dog. They're very family friendly, great with kids. They're outgoing. They have a pretty even temperament, very amenable to training. They have intelligence that, you know, sometimes labs can be smarter than people. It happens. I agree with that one. 
Well, you know, we got so, we we got so many new millennials and 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 all these different groups of people. So, mm-hmm. what's the new breeds that are on the rise in the AKC list, and why do you think they're there? And they're moving. Well, so you quickly. have to be on the lookout for the Frenchie. The French Bulldog ah. jumped from nine to six this year. It is also uh, very popular in New York. It's the number one uh, New York favorite dog for the sec the second year in a row. Yes, yeah, second year in a row. The first year for Miami and San Francisco who are falling in love with the Frenchie. But I think it's number one in California, isn't it? The most popular, because our friend, the doc, Dr. Mm -hmm. J, said it's one of the most popular breeds in in LA, isn't it? Well, so It's a very popular breed in LA, but it is the most popular breed in San Francisco. Wow. Yes, it is making its climb. I think it's risen about 32 slots over the past few years. In 10 years, Um, that's unbelievable. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. They're great apartment dwellers. They're very cute. Their temperament is very even. They're excellent for people who, you know, have not so active of a lifestyle or you may have an active lifestyle. They're very self-sufficient. And they're very chill. They give great love. So they're really great dogs. Um, but, but you know what's interesting about that particular breed? It's it's also, it's not the easiest breed. I mean, it's a great dog and I love them, but it's not necessarily mm-hmm. always for fr- uh, first-time pet owners because they can be a little stubborn, a little domineering, I think, too. They can be a little stubborn. They can. And they can be a little demanding. If mm-hmm. it's your first dog that you own, you should definitely do research to make sure it fits your lifestyle and that their temperament is, you know, matches yours. Because it can be, they can be a little frustrating and they can be a little determined, determined in their ways. They may not do what you want exactly when you want them to do it. But a lot of times they're very amenable to training. Mm. All right. Well, let's move very on amenable. a little bit here. What do you, what do you think? What advice do you have for folks interested? in purchasing or adopting a purebred dog? Well, as we would tell any dog owner, do your research. Do a fair assessment of your lifestyle, Love that. Your family. Love that. I'm giving you high snaps. <laughs> yes. Do a fair assessment of your family, your lifestyle, what your work schedule is like, and then find the breed that matches that. A lot of times people don't do that research, and they think the dog is cute and wonderful, but the dog may require more exercise or more energy than you necessarily have to give it or for the space that you live in. So the best thing you can do is do your research, find a responsible breeder, and then plan for a very happy, healthy life with your dog. Well, you know, that's interesting because one of the things, if we notice over the last umpteen years, a lot more of the larger dogs versus the smaller dogs in the last 10 years, we see less and less small dogs on the list. So you're talking your German Shepherds, your Mm -hmm. Boxers, your Labradors, um, your Rot... I mean, those dogs all need Golden Retrievers. I mean, they all need exercise. So it's kind of interesting to see how those bigger breeds are real. The exer- the dogs who need the most exercise are really popular again. When for a while we saw the Shih Tzus, the Yorkie, oh, and even a Beagle. Well, people are interested in having good health too. So yes. so consequently, they might be recognizing that good point, they can Fleck. exercise. Good yeah, point. Absolutely. I think okay. dogs like that are great for running with children. If you have children, being in the park, that kind of thing, it'll keep your kids active and you active and the dog gets exercised. So that's why some of them are really staying on the list and holding solid at their positions. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for that information. I'm going to ask you, Brandy Hunter, to, yes. can you tell us, tell our listeners where they can learn more about these breeds and how to obtain the best possible dog? So can you give us the AKC website? Sure. You can go on akc.org. If you're looking for a responsible breeder, we have a wonderful uh, we have a wonderful service called Marketplace where responsible breeders are listing. You can see the puppies. You can see the interaction with the puppies. You can see photos, video, where they're kept, what their socialization is like prior to meeting the breeder. Um, and you can also find out about our rescue network. We have a very large rescue network that is breed-specific. So Love if you that. want a purebred and a rescue, you can do both. Oh, well, wow. Thank that you was so much. Thank you so much, Brandy, for being with us today. And next time I come to New York, I'm going to stop by the AKC to see you and my gal pal, Gina. Thank you for having me, and we look forward to seeing you. And I just want to remind everybody that that was Brandy Hunter from the American Kennel Club uh, talking about the most popular breeds of dogs. But, Char, since it's that time, it's time to wrap up our show. I know, I know. And it was a great show Great today. show, great show. I especially like chatting with the Best in Show winner, Valerie Nunez Atkinson, about, about her winning the 140th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. 
What was your favorite part of the show today? You know, I you know I I love the whole show. <laughs> I mean, I love all of every part of the show. You put me on the spot. I always always learn something more about the show. But really, we want to ask the listening audience, what was the favorite part of the show for them? Yeah, and you don't have to be politically correct like her. Just let us know. Send us a tweet (laughs) or post to our social media channels at the Pet Buzz or email us at team at thepetbuzz.com. Well, you know, I want to talk about next week's show. So next week... We are talking about, now check this out, the best places to scratch your cat. (laughs) And also, we're going to bring on an expert who's going to tell us there could be eventually, believe this or not, John, a puppy shortage in the United States. Very interesting. In the next three to five years. Very interesting. A puppy shortage. That is so interesting. But that's why we're here each week to give you the Animal 411. Yeah, the down and dirty scoop. But also remember. But the scoop. But scoop. But also remember. We want to help you take better care of your pets. Peace out and pet love. Goodbye. We here at Cortelia Road Radio are pleased to bring you the best in community-supported online radio and neighborhood news. If you enjoy the station and regularly listen to our programs, please consider making a generous donation online at CortelliaRoadRadio.com. CortelliaRoadRadio.com. It only takes one second to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Or tell you road radio.